This is really good. Yeah! Woohoo! Won't you just look at those Muppets, having such fun? Why don't we ever get to have a go? I know. And here we are stuck on rubbish scanning duty. I don't understand. Why are we even scanning this stuff in the first place? What? Haven't you watched Shadow Fraxo's amazing Rust backstory video yet? No, I haven't. Is it as good as they say? It was the best 25 minutes of my life. I will have to watch that then. You must. Hopefully he will put a link to it on the screen about now. Hey, I have a joke. What do you say to a helicopter that refuses to get out of the way? I don't know. I don't like your altitude. Ha 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 ha. Greetings survivors and friends, Shadowfrax here with your weekly episode journaling the changes to Rust and being the first one of the month it does of course mean that all the new features I showed you being added to staging over March are now merged into the main branch and I'll give you an overview of those in a mo. But first, in addition to airdrops, attack choppers and random encounters with angry naturists we now have a new event, the Chinook. Periodically a transport chopper piloted by the boys in blue will appear offshore and make its way to one of a number of possible drop-off points at Tier 1 and above monuments. After circling for a while and making sure the coast is clear, which basically means shooting at players, it'll dump its payload, a high-value crate in a locked cage, at the drop zone. It may be in future that other scientists on the ground will then be trying to retrieve the supplies within, but in the meantime it's a free-for-all for any players in the area. The only problem is the cage containing the booty has a high-tech locking mechanism which must be brute force hacked, and this takes time, 15 minutes to be precise. Oh, and be careful not to damage the laptop as this will make the process take longer, although that could just be windows. Once completed, you'll gain access to the treasures inside, if you're still alive by that point of course, as in the meantime the location of the crate will have been visible on everyone's map. As a side note, the Chinook can actually be murdered and will drop a crate where it lands if it has one on board at the time. A lot of work went into this particular event which involved a number of other systems such as AI for the scientists, especially when mounted. They're enabled at junk piles as default in this update too, and the way they pilot the Chinook now will help improve other areas such as the attack chopper AI in later updates. Vehicles were firmly in focus over the last month with boats being added, as you'll know if you've been staying tuned, and you'll now find around 64 of the little aquatic gits active on a large server at any one time. They'll spawn near beaches, rivers and lighthouses, but will despawn within three hours if not kept indoors, so start designing that boathouse if you want one to stick around. If not in the water already they can be pushed until they are, and this also works to turn them the right way up. The outboard motor requires low grade to run and there's a small amount of storage in the front compartment. There's room on board for the captain and four deckhands, although only the latter can wield weapons while seated. You can also swap seats with swap seats in console or just bind that to a key, and the craft can be both damaged and repaired, having 400 health but will sink if someone successfully turns it into a sieve. Apart from getting from one side of the map to the other without using your legs and reaching icebergs without freezing your bits off, there is another bonus to owning a boat, because not only is the land covered in junk, but the pristine waters around Rust Island are now blighted with flotsam and maybe even some jetsam if you're lucky. These contain the same variety of gear as their land-based cousins, but are a lot safer to loot. However, they're not the only thing that floats now. Thanks to a new buoyancy system being implemented to get boats seaworthy, it was then easy to apply this to player corpses too, and now we all float down here. Oh, and finishing off the waterwork, bullet impacts now have a proper splash effect. There were a number of tweaks and balance paths in this update, with quite a few cost reductions, which you can see a full list of in the dev blog or just pause the screen here if you like. There was also a slight buff to heavy plate movement speed and rad protection for shirts, but HV rockets received a number of changes in particular. They do about a quarter of the damage of a normal rocket now, but are also a quarter of the cost. They're a lot more accurate and there's less time between firing and impact, which should make them actually useful for hitting, uh, oh I don't know, flying things maybe? The rocket launcher is substantially better value now too, with its material costs being more or less slashed in half, 
along with increased durability. All in all, you should hear a lot more booms in the distance after this update. Airdrop loot tables were adjusted to reward your efforts with a lot less cack items such as clothing and wooden armor and a lot more stuff that you'd actually run towards a war zone to get. This applies to elite and chinook crates too, so don't be shy when you see one. As I mentioned in a previous video, there were going to be changes to conditional models on roofs to prevent the bunker base exploit that probably a lot of you were enjoying. So sorry about that, but it's now here and you'll have to use walls to add those triangular sections now. As you can see, the AK had a slight nerf with increased recoil and a more complex recoil pattern during the initial burst. It's also less accurate from the hip due to a larger aim cone for hip fire. On the plus side though, we now have horse meat and the spike trap in caves will only damage you when you're moving and falling onto them in the first place shouldn't hurt if it's a clean drop. Performance wise, there were a number of improvements made in this update. Projectile pooling was implemented, which should mean a much smoother frame rate during fire firefights, network interpolation and extrapolation, which is probably something best read about on the dev blog when you're having trouble sleeping, now means that vehicle movement is smoother and matches more closely between server and client. And efforts to fix workshop skin loading issues should mean that new skin releases will no longer require server restarts. In addition to these, a few fixes to procedural world generation were made, as well as an update to Steamworks, and fixes for a number of issues that could contribute to servers stalling occasionally. Graphically, Hapis has had more than a 60-minute makeover with a number of new monuments and better spawns, which I've already covered in detail in previous videos. Suffice to say, this map is far more playable than it was a month ago and improvements will continue. Talking of maps, Gary reimagined the in-game one, which is now more user-friendly and has a higher level of detail, thanks to being rendered from the actual splat and normal maps. There's also a focus button to center it back on your position. If you've spent any amount of time in-game since this update hit, you'll know there's something very different about the trees. There are now two types of forest, with not only the familiar pines and firs, but also deciduous trees in a number of flavors. There are American beeches and green birches, plus large oaks scattered across the fields. All of this not only helps to add variety, but also breaks up your line of sight better and makes snaffling away a cabin in the woods much more viable, as well as a number of tweaks to shaders and color variation, wind will now affect them dynamically, with trees and bushes reacting correctly to its intensity. And talking of bushes, new player hair caps have been applied. This means much better bouffants and face fungi all round regardless of which anti-aliasing settings you use. Body fuzz should also look better close up if you're into that sort of thing, and color improvements and general bug fixes mean far less bad hair days from here on in. Last month, a temporary solution to generating water reflections was implemented, whilst a new, better system was developed. This is now in, and they once again show sun and moon detail, stars and clouds, whilst delivering better on performance. So all is good there. And lastly, in graphics, some visual voodoo has been taking place behind the scenes to make shadows and reflections appear more natural. I won't go into to detail here, that's what the dev blog's there for in this case, but you'll probably see these take effect next month as they require artist intervention. Over to works in progress now, and I have already shown you these, but I'll show you again. Monument puzzles will be stretching your tiny IQs at some point soon, with access all areas no longer being a given. There'll be different levels of security that will require key cards and a basic knowledge of fuses to bypass. You may get basic key cards from scientists, while others will be behind low level level doors. No doubt we'll get more info on these over the next month. And finally, a new monument is in the works, which by the looks of it may mean another addendum to my stab at the backstory. This is all we know about the scientist compound at the moment. It'll be a hub for scientists to regroup and even sell things to us through vending machines, and apparently will look like an urban settlement that represents a portion of a much larger town, where scientists will have walled off what they could afford to defend. Look for this to be in next month's big update to Maine, and stay tuned as I will of course bring you details as I get them. Thank you for watching, liking and subscribing to the channel. Do come and join me at all the other stables in my online domain such as Twitch, Twitter, Discord and my Steam group. I shall catch you all soon, but in the meantime, keep calm and stay rusty. Cheerio.